Congress have been finding in this question for the proliferation answers to CI's secretary IT response to dietary antigens, hence it reduces um, uh, dietary allergies, and it modulates cytokine responses to respiratory antigens. You might think, oh, well, how could it do that? But keep in mind the whole concept of the common mucosal immune system, so that if you have something going on in the gut associated with lymphatic um, tissue, that's going to affect um, immune tissues elsewhere in the body. Bacterium diffidum um, is there are smaller populations of, of this organism, this helpful organism found in allergic infants, populations of diffidum, the diffidum tends to decline with age. Talk about how people speculate that, that reduced immune function increases susceptibility to disease in the elderly may be in part related to reduced bifidobacterium populations. Obviously, with its ability to suppress total and antigen specific IgE production, it's going to be protective against allergies. Um, it enhances IgA response to clostridium difficile antigen, uh, toxin A rather, and it's been shown together with lactose acidophilus to support a normal microbiota during antibiotic therapy and reduces testing for C. difficile toxin A. Bifidobacterium is as you can deduce from the name. This is very frequent in infants, rare in adults. If, if, if uh, you're a breastfed baby, your microbiota should have lots of bifidobacterium and fantasis. It's a good thing. Um, it suppresses populations of bacteroides vulgaris, reduces pro-inflammatory cytokine, cytokine production, improves various cytokine ratios in, in, in irritable bowel syndrome, and together with acidophilus, well acidophilus reduces the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis in very low birth weight infants. So, the Brave, the Fibacterium Brave, um, this has been shown to reduce half of the populations of pathogens, Bacteroides flagellus, uh, and Clostridium perfringes. It uh, improves weight gain, very low birth weight infants, stimulates virus past B cell proliferation, so again, it stimulates normal maturation of the gastro intestinal immune system. Relatively um, um, hardy organism, uh, resistant to acid, bile, pest, and pancreas, and um, enhances B cell antibody production. In fact, some work um, that it, that it uh, um, <coughs> improves the, the response to immunization. So it can antagonize rotavirus and decrease its rotavirus. So, Okay. Just going to touch briefly on bacillus characteristics. Um, these are frequently misbranded, misidentified organisms. So if you're going to use bacillus probiotics, um, be sure that, that it's from a reputable uh, manufacturer. These are sporulating rods. These are facultative anaerobes. People used to think that any bacillus that was in the gut was just there because it was on the carrot that you consumed or the potato or whatever, that these were transient. Well, but it turns out that with some species like bacillus subtilis, there are more of them in the gut that you can displace it simply by ingestion. So, so, so low, low levels of them are definitely um, commensal. And bacilli are, are commonly used in fermented fish and manioc and soy foods. So, for example, Japanese food, natto, um, that's, that's produced by um, uh, bacillus subtilis. Um, so so they, they, there's evidence that they're useful in irritable bowel syndrome, the prevention of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. They can inhibit pathogens, they make bacteriocins and mycopentides, and they definitely promote colonocyte health. Um, so there's a role for them, but, but they're frequently misbranded. So, so make sure you're getting them from a reputable company. These are some of the bacillus probiotics that are used. Primarily bacillus coagulants and bacillus subtilis are the most important. So Streptomophilus is a, is a lactic acid bacteria. This is a traditional cheese and yogurt starter. It's highly adapted to living on lactose. It's transient. There's proto-cooperation with lactobacillus pulvericus, which is another um, yogurt starter. And um, it has a, a variety of different um, clinical uses, from rotavirus to improvement in ulcerative colitis and maintaining remission in ulcerative colitis and, and, and other inflammatory diseases. And there's some evidence that it can protect, um, provide protection from pathogenic streptococcus species. Saccharomyces boulardii, this is this probiotic yeast, transient, non-pathogenic. Um, it was dis described by, or discovered by a French mycologist, Boulard, who found it in, in Southeast Asia. People were brewing a tea from lychee nuts to treat dysentery, and he figured out that it was the Saccharomyces boulardii that was the active principle in these, in these um, teas. This um, is a very hardy organism and does an amazing number of things, increases cross border enzyme activity. Um, it's the D1 intervention that is going to increase um, intestinal um, short-chain fatty acids and secretory IgA concentrations more than anything else that you can do. It has a powerful protease and inhibits clostridium difficile toxins A and D, antagonizes candidate in the gut. And it's the one probiotic um, that has been shown to be effective, at least as an adjunct against, um, against um, uh, unicellular parasites like Antoniva, Hespolitica, and Giardia. And there's actually one study that showed that it was just as good as metronidazole in treating blastocystis thrombus. So pro probiotics, the documented uses of probiotics, is the literature that supports the use, there are meta-analyses that supports the use. It's, it's not really controversial. People can argue about the quality of the studies and that sort of thing, but there is a literature that supports the use in antibiotic-associated diarrhea, clostridium-associated diarrhea, various other uh, diarrhea community travelers that have uh, uh, um, use in inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, um, and, and uh, vaginal dysbiosis, so, so candida, vaginitis, and bacterial vaginosis, recurrent urinary tract infections in women, allergies, atopic dermatitis, eczema, lactose intolerance, hyperlipidemia. There are things that, that, that people are, are looking at now, like probiotics and weight loss, probiotics and blood sugar control, pro probiotics and depression, probiotics and anxiety. So, so there's a lot of uh, the, 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 the documented uses are standing for probiotics. Well, let's just look at some of these. So antibiotic-associated diarrhea, this is disrupted GI microbiota. Due to antibiotics, that's, that's what this is due to. And so, everybody with antibiotics is here to diarrhea, but the, the common denominator here is that they have um, decreased colonic concentrations of short chain fatty acids. 
50% of the cases are due to clostridia deficiency, but everybody's got decreased short-chain fatty acids. So basically, the antibiotic is killing off the organisms and make short-chain fatty acids, especially deuterate, so acetate, propionic, and deuterate. And, and deuterate is, in particular, is important. It's nutritive to colonocytes. Colonocytes don't get this. They don't do what colonocytes do, which is absorb water, absorb salt, um, and so they get diarrhea. <coughs> It's common, you know, how common it is, depends on the series you look at, but, but it's common. So, you know, children anywhere from 11 to 50 percent, adults 5 to 39 percent, it depends on the series, um, patient population, et cetera. Um, and it, the definition is that of antibiotic associated diarrhea, any diarrhea otherwise unexplained, takes place within two months after a course of antibiotics. Probiotics work. And so, so here's a, a large meta analysis that was done by Linda Farland, and um, she looked at all of these different trials. And, and these are these are different probiotic preparations and formulas. So, for example, SD is, is, is Saccharomyces boulardii, LGG is lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, um, bacillus coagulans, Diplobacterium lactis, um, so, so, um, Enterococcus fecium, so, so all these different, lactobacillus acetophilus, uh, so all these different um, protocols. And what, um, what Lynn found was that out of 25 randomized clinical trials, that the overall risk reduction was 0.43. So that's a 57% reduction in the risk of antibiotic associated diarrhea. Very, very profound. And, you know, and, and probiotics should definitely be used when you're prescribing antibiotics. I don't know why clinicians would do that. So in terms of, of what um, should be used, what the literature supports is, is Saccharomyces boulardii. So then the dose should be 10 billion CFU a day. And ultimately that should be combined with lactobacillus rhamnosus, so 5 billion CFU a day. And I think it would be very advisable to use a multi-strain formula that also contains some difficult bacteria because we saw some of these species antagonize um, Australian deficiency and decrease its, its proliferation, that sort of thing. Also, one should consider using prebiotics, specifically inulin um, prebiotics, to increase short-chain fatty acid uh, producing population. So we, we, we don't have eubacteria and rosaburia available to us um, as probiotics, um, but we can increase their, their populations and activity by, by, um, by giving people prebiotics. Um, in, in general, um, I think you should use probiotics at the same time concomitantly with, with the antibiotics in order to minimize the effect of the antibiotic on the, the probiotic and to maximize survival of the probiotics that we take in. I suggest people take their probiotics an hour before or two hours after the antibiotic dose. And I've always suggested a 30-day total course of, of probiotics. So even though your antibiotic treatment may be a week or 10 days, I've, I've always suggested a 30-day total treatment. Yeah, inflammatory bowel disease, so this, this includes Crohn's disease, um, ulcerative colitis, and pouchitis. Um, there are differences in these. Pouchitis is, is disease that's involving um, uh, a portion of the ileum that's being used as a, as a rectal pouch following surgery for almost all cases of uh, ulcerative colitis. And we know that, that inflammatory bowel disease is, is due to a, an abnormal response to certain commensal bacteria. So that if, if you have no bacteria, or let's say, for example, you have rectal ulcerative colitis and, and the surgeon does a ileostomy to divert the, the flow, of, of intestinal content, con contest, um, you can treat the disease by, by decreasing exposure to intestinal contents and commensal bacteria. People with inflammatory bowel disease have high numbers of bacteroides, aerobacteriaceae, and pentostreptococcus, and you guess it, low numbers of different bacteria. Really, um, the, I have to say, the, 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 the animal models, this, it seems like probiotics should just be gangbusters. So, so here you have this, this, this rat model of, of inflammatory bowel disease, this HLA-D27 transgenic rat, and if you raise it, there's no, if you raise it germ-free, so there's no intestinal microbiota, the rat does not get colitis. But when you introduce fecal bacteria into the rat, you get a very, very aggressive colitis. So, so there's this interaction with this genetic predisposition and the presence of fecal bacteria. If you introduce, remember these, these are notobiotic organisms, so you have control over what you are introducing. You know what is in the gut. So if you put in just bacteroides vulgaris, you get colitis. So that's one of the things that's in the fecal mix that's giving you colitis. But it's not as bad as everything that's in there, so it's just one thing. If you introduce E. coli, so this, this aerobic, um, aerobacter reaceae, there's no colitis, so we know that that's not the problem. If you introduce lactobacillus rhamnosus plus fecal bacteria, you completely predict, or predict this rat from getting colitis. So why, so probiotics should just be wonderful, but they've been disappointing. And, and, um, and so here, here are studies um, that are looking at um, probiotics in um, Crohn's disease and also colitis and palsitis. And with the exception of palsitis, for which um, cancer analysis say that the evidence is good, they use probiotics, most of these studies are negative. Well, what about that? Well, <clears throat> some of this is, is study design. So, so for example, we look at this study, so here's a, um, treatment of Crohn's disease using uh, escolarity. So, so, so this is a, you're using escolarity as an adjunct. So the standard therapy was alamine 3 grams a day versus alamine 2 grams a day in escolarity. And the number of clinical relapses was significantly less. So, so uh, is the appropriate endpoint in study? So probiotics probably don't have a big role in treating acute flares, but they clearly, I think, have a role in keeping people in remission. Now here's, here's a study of, of people with Crohn's disease in, in remission, and so this is um, involving a, a preparation called DSL number 3, which is a simply a multi-species high-potency probiotic based around streptococcus thermophilus. And, um, and here you see that, that this is a study that shows probiotics don't, don't work, right? But there's only 40 patients. There was a 50% um, a reduction in, in relapses.
differences, but the numbers were not significant. So, so is this 50% reduction not real, it's just by chance, or was it not, not significant because this is an underpowered study, probably an underpowered study? That's the problem with probiotic studies, is they often have um, too small of a sample size, and that might be why probiotics in the literature turned out to be disappointing in, in um, inflammatory policies. They're not disappointing in the treatment of, of calcitis, and again, um, most of the data comes from DSL number three, this high potency multi-species um, pro probiotic, and is clearly effective. Now, one of the things about probiotics is it's become clear that single probiotic species don't work in inflammatory bowel disease. They just don't work. But, if you, but, but, but combining them with inulin, so for example, prebiotics, so for example, in the study here at the bottom where they combine inulin um, and fructose with this bacteria along them, they had great results. Um, 18 patients, active ulcerative colitis, and they were assessed clinically, sigmoidoscopically, and histologically, and they had significant improvement clinically and improvement in their sigmoidoscopy scores and decreased tissue inflammation, increased um, healing. So, so the combination of bifidobacterium probiotic with prebiotics is beneficial in this population. People have looked at an open label study of inulin alone, 15 grams a day, don't start anybody at 15 grams a day, but work up to that. And again, uh, significant improvement and also increased bifidobacterium populations. Um, prebiotics are a great way of increasing bifidobacterium populations. And, um, <clears throat> and again, um, inulin has been used alone in pouchitis, uh, again, some benefits. So, so probiotics plus prebiotics um, are the way to go in inflammatory bowel disease. So my suggestion is for... Welcome to our 
our webinar entitled The Lifestyle Factor, Utilizing Testing to Encourage Behavior Change. Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Chapman. My name is Christine Scooby and I'm a medical education specialist at Genova's Asheville branch. I am going to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Michael Chapman. Michael Chapman is a licensed naturopathic physician who graduated from Vassar University in Seattle, Washington. Upon graduation, he spent three years in private practice before joining the team at Genova Diagnostics. His area of clinical focus includes hormone regulation, gastrointestinal health, and autonomic balance. Prior to medical school, Dr. Chapman earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Indiana University with a focus in neuropsychology. He later worked as a microbiologist performing pharmaceutical research on cancer cell lines. Dr. Chapman has a passion for learning and helping others come to a greater understanding of the vast and dynamic processes that exist and interact with the human body. One of the most common questions we get asked during the webinars is about availability of this presentation in the slide deck. These materials will be available on our website within a week of the webinar. If you are interested in having these resources, please click the Learn Now link on the home page where you will find access to our webinars, or you can also log in to find the webinars in your MyGDX account. If you do not have a MyGDX account, please click on the Getting Started link on our home page. And now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Chapman. We should be all good to go here. Great. And uh, thank you all for being here just a few days before uh, one of our biggest holiday weekends. Um, you know, as Christine mentioned, uh, one of my areas of clinical focus is sit around uh, endocrine balance, hormone regulation, uh, as well as GI health. But the, the more that I really started to try to uncover uh, some of the elements that really go into uh, creating some of those dysfunctions, the more I just started to really uh, and understand that this lifestyle component is just huge. And the more I tried to start researching around things that we can really do as clinicians to encourage the overall behavior change for our patients. And that's why I think this is such a, a really interesting and great topic. Um, I know it's also an interesting time to bring up this topic of lifestyle and, and maybe a little bit apropos for myself. I know it's one of those kinds here that I might be thinking more about minimizing damage rather than lifestyle even than necessarily. But my aim is really to arm you with some tools as a clinician moving forward with your patients. Because after all, January 1st is uh, a lot of times we see more of a surge in patients' motivation for a fitness and better lifestyle. And so maybe you'll take away a few thoughts and ideas to help them. Uh, just be a bit more successful in those attempts. So some objectives for this webinar, we're going to take into the importance of addressing lifestyle with patients. I don't think many of us would disagree that talking lifestyle with our patients isn't important uh, or it is important, but I will expand on it for a moment just because sometimes we have so many things to cover during our appointments that maybe it's something that gets to go off until next time or then the next time. So just want to impress on, on how important I think it is contextually. Uh, and then we're going to talk about kind of key behavior patterns to be assessed and look at. Um, and then how we use our specialty testing as a window into our patient's lifestyle and our habits. And then ultimately we'll kind of circle back and hopefully talk about the tools to help cultivate positive behavior change for your patients. So here's a graphic on the right-hand side of the page that uh, I, I just gave up that represents how I personally view these concepts as, as relating to each other. Um, I did major in psychology, so I feel like I had a little bit of creative license here to kind of make up theories whenever I want, the likes of Piaget and some of those other great minds, but this is just kind of a representation of uh, why I think talking about this is so important. Uh, you know, as conscientious practitioners, we're constantly trying to, to really uncover, you know, the why. Why are our patients having these symptoms? What, what led into that? Um, but for most of us, where in this graphic did we really receive the largest amount of education and experience? Um, it was really in, you know, understanding, diagnosing, treating Frank disease. And, and this isn't a bad thing, because really, Frank disease is a part of the spectrum that's most likely to be acutely threatening to our immediate health. So we really do need to have a huge understanding and, and appreciation for that, for that knowledge. Um, and then many of you, you know, if you're here listening to this webinar, it, it might be because you're integrating these sort of functional understandings, these ideas around functional disturbance into your spectrum of healthcare. And, and really, this is kind of where our specialty lab testing can be uh, so useful. So what do I mean is when I say functional disturbances? Um, when I think of functional disturbance, one of the things that's an identifier to me is whether the condition is easily shown to be multifactorial. You know, so fatigue, there can be a lot of things that go into creating this irritable bowel syndrome, uh, hormone dysfunction. A lot of these are multifactorial conditions. Um, so I just keep this in mind uh, when I'm talking about some of these symptoms and manifestations because uh, it helps to kind of untether the relationships um, and how they interact with lifestyle factors. However, as you can see, according to my data graphic here on the right, these functional disturbances a lot of times originate at least in part from poor lifestyle habits. And what do we really do in our practice to truly affect lifestyle? I think, you know, a lot of times what we do as clinicians is patient education, which is really great. You know, it, this is where we talk about things like hydration and exercise and, you know, fiber intake and, and antioxidants and berries and all those things. We're providing information to our patients so they can kind of understand a little bit more about their lifestyle. But my question ultimately becomes, is that enough? Because many patients know that some of the behaviors and habits that they're doing are 